I believe that creativity is one of the greatest assets human beings have. It's an underused asset, but it's something we all have. I believe that creativity can be learned and that we can improve our creativity and make it stronger through a simple set of exercises. And I believe that if we were all more creative, the world would be a better and happier place. My name is Harlan Coburn, and I spent all my working life in creativity as a writer, director, producer, musician, things like this. I've also spent many years working in creativity workshops, hands-on creativity workshops with a, a very wide variety of people. These range from teenagers, people with recovering drug addicts, prisoners, business people, professional artists, and so on. What I've noticed from all of that is that there are what I call creativity rules. It's strange, but across this very wide group of people of all ages, different cultures, different countries, people pretty much behave in the same way when they are given the opportunity to be creative. Now, in case you think this is some kind of specialist knowledge from my ivory tower, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about my own background. Because what I want to talk about are small, definable steps. And my own background is that a long time ago, I was born in the northeast of England. I was very fortunate because my parents were poor. So why is that fortunate? It's fortunate because the soil I grew up in, I saw my mother had to make the clothes for the family. My father had to make the furniture for the family. And together, my mother and father even made the house, the little house, that the family lived in. So the soil, the place that I grew up in, was very rich in creativity. But there was a problem. My parents thought that creativity was contained only in the home. And as I and my sister went through our teenage years, we wanted to be the world's greatest artists, the world's greatest musicians, poets. We wanted to go outside the home with our creativity. And we were greatly discouraged from that. And this is actually what happens with, I think, pretty well all of us. When we're very, very small, we're encouraged to do just about anything. We learn to write our names or to do a little dance. Everybody applauds all around us. And then we go to school. We start school and we get all these fantastic opportunities thrown at us, paint and pencils and the opportunity to sing in the school choir and to be in the school play. And our creativity just takes off. It's incredibly exciting. But then by the time we finish school, not long afterwards, 10 years or so afterwards, our creativity has gone down. Why is that? Well, it's what I think of as the professionalization of creativity. Now, I'm not against anyone being professional. If you want to be in an orchestra and play the violin, you've got to be professional, of course. But your creativity doesn't need to be professionalized. And what's happened all of those years in school is that what we've been learning is what went wrong. That's what our education does to us. Not what we do right, but what went wrong. Even when something goes right, we learn to listen out for this word, but. So we're told, yes, your painting or your song or your poem or whatever you've done, your painting was fantastic. And we're already going, 
I know what's coming, I know what's coming, I know what's coming. But, and then we're told. And that's what our education does to us. The professionalization of creativity closes the door on our creativity. It really saddens me when I meet people who are 20 years old, for instance, and they say things like, yes, I used to really enjoy drama at school. Yes, I used to play the trombone at school. Yes, I used to, I used to, I used to. Now I'm 20 and the door is closed on all of this. So the idea of creativity rules is to open the door, making things possible. How do we do this? Well, one of the first things is simply to take risks. We live in a very risk-averse society, and there's a good reason for that. If I'm going for an operation, I don't want my doctor to take risks. If I'm getting on a plane, I don't want the pilot to take risks. But what's the worst thing that can happen with your creativity if you take risks? What's the worst thing that can happen is that nobody dies unless it's those inner critics that you've been taught to listen to that tell you, but, but, but. Even if they're telling you good things, they're telling you, it was good, but. We have to change but to and. It was good and it could be better next time if you try this. So take risks. Now, people often ask about inspiration at these workshops that I do. They say, oh, yeah, this is fine. OK, Harlan, I'll take some risks. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But what about inspiration? Well, I was very pleased that Ahab came before this presentation because he talked about breathing. And that's an incredibly important thing to do when you want to be creative. That's the meaning of to inspire, to breathe. So tomorrow morning, you have to finish an essay. And you're up against the deadline. Oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You're getting tense. You're getting nervous. You can't get ideas. You're going to sit down at your laptop and try and write this essay. What you should do is stand up and just breathe. And when you breathe, you move and moving, start the process of having ideas and being creative. I don't know how many people know a song, and I hope I pronounce it correctly, called Somaru Vasharana. Does anyone know it? The English translation is usually gloomy Sunday, maybe a day a bit like this afternoon. It's a gloomy Sunday, it's raining perhaps, and there's a little girl sitting at the kitchen table and she goes, Daddy, 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 I'm bored. What should I do, what should I do? And Daddy goes, don't know. And then he has an idea and he gets some pens and some paper and some paint and some plasticine and some rubber bands and some old cardboard boxes and some scissors and some glue and all kinds of things and puts them on the table. From that moment on, the little girl is not bored and hopefully the father isn't bored either because they're having ideas by handling materials. Now it may seem incredibly obvious that if you want to play the trombone, you've got to have a, a trombone. You've got to have the materials to do these things. And yet, I meet people all the time who say, hmm, yeah, I've always wanted to play the guitar. Okay? Do you have a guitar? Uh, no. I, I'm thinking about getting one, though. So have ideas by handling materials. When you have ideas by handling materials, you start to do this thing that I call splurging. Splurging is when the inner and the outer critics are temporarily silenced. How are they silenced? Because in a few moments, you're having ideas by handling materials, and you get excited, whether you're a little kid or 
somebody from a very different background. And this happens with everybody, everybody I've ever seen who allows themselves to engage with their creativity starts to splurge. Splurging is that thing that happens when you go, bah! and you're excited. It's fun, it's playful. That's what splurging is. Here are the original words to a famous song. I don't know if anyone recognizes the famous song. There used to be a band a long time ago called the Beatles. And one of the songwriters of the band was a guy called Paul McCartney. One day, he was having ideas by handling materials, in this case, a piano, his voice, a notepad, and a pencil. And he started getting this beautiful tune coming that he was composing. And he knew it was a song, and he knew it had to have words. But he was splurging. He was in that first 20 minutes or so of, ah, this is exciting. So he didn't worry about what the words had to be. He just made up the first words that came to his mind that fitted with this song that he was playing on the piano. And for a long time afterwards, apparently, until it made it to an album, the Beatles called this song the Scrambled Eggs Song. If you don't recognize it, maybe I should try and sing it. Should I try and sing it? Yeah. Scrambled eggs. Oh, my baby, how I love your legs. Not as much as I love scrambled eggs. It's the song that became yesterday, but it was the scrambled egg song for a long time. What McCartney did, and what everyone does who has splurged, is that he stepped back to see the bigger picture. And this is what everyone does. You see it especially if someone is, is painting a picture, literally painting a picture. They're involved in the canvas. They're completely in there. And then at a certain point, something happens. They step back and they look at what they've just done in a different way. They see the bigger picture. And what happens then is that they start to edit. And this is a universal process. It could be a five-year-old, it could be a 50-year-old, it could be anyone. The process of editing begins. Here's a slide that I showed you earlier. It's about splurging. I made the slide by splurging. So I sat down at my computer and I went Bleh! for a few minutes and I got, I got excited. Yeah, green, orange, blue, yeah, that, that, that does splurging. But now I'm editing. So now I'm thinking, hmm, maybe, maybe I should go back and maybe I should think about what I, what I did first. Oh yeah, that, that doesn't look so, so crazy. Yeah, I like that. Then I look at it and think, hmm, perhaps I should just turn it upside down. So I'm now in this process of editing. What happens after this, and again, it always happens, is that we stop. So we consider now what we are doing. We've edited, we stop, we decide what to do next. People who are really in touch with their creativity start again. This is what makes people like, let's say, Picasso or Chantvari or Bartok Bela or J.K. Rowling or Sabo Magda, the people that we recognize by their works because they don't just write or draw or paint or compose one time. Of course they don't. They stop and they start again. Did Picasso paint La Guernica, one of his groundbreaking pictures, and then say, oh well, that's it, that's me finished, bye. No, of course he didn't. He stopped and then he started again. Now you may be saying, okay, this is great, fine, but I'm not Picasso, I'm not John Fari. So what should I do? How do I get out of 
trouble or even just get started if I want to be more creative? My answer is use chance. Chance is always your friend. Chance will jump you off the lines you're on into another place. Sometimes you can just make up a few rules for yourself. Take a dice or a couple of dice, shake them and you've decided that if it's a six you'll do this, if it's a four you'll do that, if it's a three you'll do that. Or you can shout out to a friend and say, give me a word, any word, any word. And you use that word as part of the process. Why? Because the idea is to get you out of the ordinary, get you away from the things that you already know. Chance is your friend in creativity. So these are the rules of creativity. They're very simple, small, definable steps. Take risks, of course. What have you got to lose? Breathe and move. Have ideas by handling materials. And when you have ideas by handling materials, then you can splurge. And when you've splurged, you consider. You step back. You see the bigger picture. When you see the bigger picture, you edit. And if you're in touch with your creativity, then you stop and you start again. And if you can't start again, use chance. These are my rules, taken from my observation and my experience. But maybe they're not your rules. So the final thing to remember is that actually, of course, there are no creativity rules. It's entirely up to you what you do with your creativity. For me, however, creativity rules. Thank you.